can't find a seat, we'll try to bring some more chairs. In. <laughs> We're delighted that you're with us for our Bible study here with the Elmore Church of Christ. We're in a study on human suffering. Last week, we were talking about some areas in which people suffer physically, and we'd like to continue that today. We talked about suffering through sickness and through death, and today we'd like to begin by talking about suffering through growing old, aging. Now, I, I realize that I'm too young to deal authoritatively with the subject of growing old, but we'll do the best we can with it. We are delighted that all of you are with us today, all right. We're studying aging today. I'm not one to advertise my age. I don't really care for doing that. <laughs> Some people use Facebook and advertise to the world when they're having a birthday and how old they are, but uh, that's not my thing. I've never really felt comfortable doing that. Uh, but those who know me know that I'm, fairly old. <laughs> a friend of mine was talking with me on one occasion about uh, my physical problems, and he said, uh, considering the problems that you have now, what will it be like when you grow old? <laughs> he already knew that I was old. He was just emphasizing that, I think. Someone asked me one time, how old are you? And I said, can you keep a secret? He said, yes. I said, I can too. I don't normally advertise how old I am. Sometimes I joke with people and say, now, I will admit that I'm not as young as I look. Now, that throws them a bit because they expected me to say I'm not as old as I look. But uh, all of us are growing older. I must admit that I'm not looking forward to it. But it's coming. And you know we're strange a little bit about that. I am at least. We don't want to die. Yet at the same time we don't want to look old or get old. But it's one or the other. We have to make a choice. And sometimes I tell people my hair is prematurely gray. But those who look at me can see well understand that. It's not prematurely gray. It's just gray. It's, uh, I think it's good for us to develop a good sense of humor about some of these things. It helps us to cope with it a little bit if we can laugh about it. Someone told about a, a lady who was not married, and they called her an old maid. I never liked calling a lady like that an old maid. I'd rather call them an unclaimed blessing. But uh, this person called this lady an old old lady, really. That's not a good thing to do, especially an old maid. But she said to her friend, I've made arrangements for my funeral, and she told her some of the things she had written down for her funeral, and one of them said, I, I don't want any men serving as the pallbearers at my funeral. I just want women. And her friend asked her, why do you just want women? Why did you say you don't want any men serving at your, as your pallbearers? She said, well, those men wouldn't take me out while I was living. I don't want them to take me out when I die. <laughs> it's good to develop a sense of humor about some of these things. It might help us to deal with them a little better. But the truth of the matter is, we're all getting older. We're all growing older. You know, when this nation was founded, a baby that was born could expect to live about 35 years. Now think about that. A life expectancy was about 35 when our nation was founded. Today, when a child is born, we can expect them to live 77 or 78 years. Uh, we live a long time today. Now, some believe that getting old is a curse. I don't really think it's a curse, personally. I just don't like to advertise my age. But it's better than the alternative, you know. Getting old is better than dying young. The Bible teaches that there are some blessings in being old. Solomon has a good bit to say about that in the book of Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 16, verse 31, he said, The hoary head is a crown of glory, if it be found in the way of righteousness. When a person grows old and his hair turns gray or turns loose, uh, 
that can be a good thing if he's a righteous person. Growing old, you know, doesn't take away from that. If he's a righteous person, it is a glory to him. Again, in Proverbs 20 and verse 29, he said, The glory of young men is their strength, and the beauty of old men is the gray head. Now, young people can boast about being strong. You know, they have a lot of strength, get up and go and all that when they're young. But, you know, old men or women can rejoice in the fact that they are old and have more wisdom and more knowledge generally than those who are young. There are some blessings in being older. Have you ever wondered about whether you're getting old or not? You ever stop and think about that? I ran across something that indicates whether you're getting old or not. How to know if you're getting older. Everything hurts, and what doesn't hurt doesn't work. You feel like the night before and you haven't been anywhere. Your little black book contains only names ending in MD. You get winded playing chess. Your children begin to look middle-aged. You look forward to a dull evening. You sit in a rocking chair and you can't get it going. Your knees buckle and your belt won't. You're 17 around the neck and 42 around the waist. <laughs> you stop looking forward to your next birthday. Dialing long distance wears you out, even though you just have to touch things now. You sink your teeth into a steak, and they stay there. Somebody brings you a glass of water and says it before you at a party, and you take your teeth out and put them in there. <laughs> Some man was talking to his friend one morning. He said, it's so cold last night, I shivered all night long. His friend said, do your teeth chatter? He said, I don't know. We don't sleep together. <laughs> there are some indications that we're growing older. And you know, it's funny sometimes to read epitaphs on tombstones. Some of them really show that somebody had some humor. One said, Sally Morgan, December 10th, 1864. Here lies my wife. Let her lie. She's at peace, and so am I. <laughs> that might indicate that a marriage was not what it ought to be. Then there was a fellow named Solomon Pease, P-E-A-S-E, -E, who had died. And someone said, this is the way it was said on the epitaph, this ain't Pease, it's only the pod. The Pease been shelled and gone to God. <laughs> That's a good way to look at death, isn't it? like shelling peas. And so there are a number of things that indicate that we are getting older. We might as well accept it. And that applies to me. And when I say I think it's a good thing for us to develop a sense of humor about some of these things, and that applies to me as well when I think about growing older. Now, they can say what they want to about this business of being over the hill. It's better than being under it. And as we said, Solomon talks a great deal about this business of growing old. Paul does too. There's a passage in Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. I'd like for us to notice. Now, you may think that has nothing to do with growing old, but let's sort of look behind it a little bit. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, we don't need to feel obsolete. And you might ask, what do you mean by that? When was the last time you saw a pay telephone? They've become obsolete. When was the last time you saw a pay or a phone booth? they become obsolete. No longer useful, no longer needed. Sometimes we may think that we have become obsolete when we grow old, no longer wanted, no longer needed. But in these two verses, the Apostle Paul, I think, teaches us not to look to the past, but look to the future and keep on pressing toward that goal. We don't give up just because we become old. We press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Paul reminds us 
that we do not have to peak spiritually. Now, we may grow to a certain point and peak physically, and then we may begin to go downhill physically. But that's not true spiritually. You can keep on going up, climbing always toward heaven. And so Paul said, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so I'd like to emphasize the fact that we not be worried about future and becoming old, but think about the spiritual, and we can keep on growing, keep on going up. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul said, after talking about things that happen to us and God's grace that comes to us, for which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inner man is renewed day by day. Now the outward man is a physical body. That's that, that pod. But the inward man is the most important. And the inward man can keep on growing, getting better and better day by day. In verse 18 he said, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So we need to think about the spiritual, the inward man, not this physical body so much. Now we're concerned about it, obviously. But that's not the most important thing. We need to think about the inward man, the spiritual part of man, and keep on growing. And we can keep on growing until we die. In Colossians 3, 1 and 2, you remember that Paul said, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, and not on things of this earth. Now I think these verses are sort of intertwined with the ones that we've talked about. The Bible teaches that we need to think about heaven and about the spiritual life that we will enjoy there and not be so concerned about this physical body. Now, did you know that Americans spend billions of dollars every year at the cosmetic counter in an effort to restore the rose of adolescence that has long since faded away? Now, we might tell ourselves, it's to make me look better. Well, behind all of that probably is the fact we want it to make us to look younger. That's why we get those creams and all fill up those wrinkle areas, you know. We want to look younger. But we can do that. There's nothing wrong with that. But the most important thing ought to be the spiritual man, the inward man. And we ought to be taking care of it, doing what we can to make sure we reach our goal by setting our affections on things above. Well, I was reading recently a statement from someone. They, they asked a question. Do wrinkles hurt? Have you seen that question recently? Do wrinkles hurt? Well, we're concerned about how we look with all the wrinkles. We ought not to be so concerned about that. Wrinkles don't really hurt. It's our perception of ourselves when we have them. And so when our hair turns gray or turns loose, all the wrinkles come, we need to realize that doesn't hurt us. You won't even feel it. There are some things that come along with age, but we need to be concerned most of all with the inward man. Life's greatest tragedy is not the wasting away of the outer man, but it is the unnecessary death of the inward man. So we need to get our focus upon the soul, the inner man, and eternity with Christ. In 1 Timothy 4 and 8, you will remember that Paul told that young preacher, for bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. Now, it's all right to exercise. That's fine. It'll help the body some, but only for this life. It really won't have anything to do with eternity. But the inward man is the most important. Godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. And so we need to focus our attention upon the soul, the inner man, and eternity, and not so much concern about the physical body and whether it is growing old or not. Finally, Paul affirms that for each of us, the best is yet to be. Somebody wrote a poem along that line, I think. The best is yet to be. In Philippians 1, 21 and 23, in a passage I think we talked about last week, Paul said, for to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. 
Now, he didn't say it was a loss or it was a tragedy. It is a gain. And then in verse 23, he said, For I'm in a strait betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. For Paul to live here on earth, stay here on earth, on earth for a while, would be for him to teach other people and help them to prepare to go to heaven. Going to heaven is the most important thing. And so Paul says, it's better for me to stay here and teach you so you can go to heaven, but to go to be with Christ is far better. The best is yet to be for the faithful child of God. Now, there's another point that I'd like to make about growing old. We are determining right now what we are going to be when we get older. I read a little story recently that I think needs to be repeated. Uh, repeated. An elderly, white-haired lady was visiting with a young mother and her little girl, and she was just as nice and sweet and good as she can be, and it impressed that little girl. And when the elderly lady left, this little girl said to her mama, you know, if I could be old like her, sweet and good and loving, I wouldn't mind being old so much. And the mama was a wise person. She says to that little girl, if you want to be an older woman like her when you get old, you better start working on it now. She doesn't look like somebody who made a change overnight. It took a long time for her to become like she is. I don't know how much that little girl understood in all of that, but that's a good point. If we want to be sweet and kind and good and all of that when we're older, we better start working on it now. I think it was Brother Ira North who said, when you get old, you is what you is, but only is her. <laughs> now, the grammar's not too good in that, but it's said that way to make a point. When you get old, you're going to be what you were when you were young, only to a greater extent. So if you want to be a person who's kind and good and loving when you get older, you better start working on it now. Now's the time to do it. When you're sweet-spirited, have a good attitude. When you are young, that's the kind of person you're going to be when you get 75. We must work on it now. Well, our time is getting by, so I think perhaps we better go on to another one. Another way in which we suffer is through poverty. I told you in the beginning that when I put together notes for a class on this subject, and I'd read about 60 books, somehow I had overlooked poverty as one of the ways in which you suffer. And that's because those folks had not discussed it in all those books and periodicals that I had read. In the last three books, it was mentioned briefly. But I believe we need to think more about it. It's possible for people to suffer in poverty. Now, I hope you'll not uh, be too bothered by me using myself as an example, an illustration of this, uh, because there may be some who think, well, Charlie, you don't know how it is to be poor. You don't know how it is to be hungry, not have money to pay your bills or whatever. But I'd like to differ with you on that. I do know. I've been there and done that. I was born in poverty, lived in poverty for the first part of my life. My father and mother had eight kids. Well, that's better than too many, I guess, but that's a lot of kids. He had about 10 mouths to feed. And my father had very little education. I think he only went to the third grade. He didn't have much experience or knowledge or anything that would enable him to have a better job. He made very little money. And he was a drunkard, smoked heavily. And much of what he made went to buy alcohol and tobacco. He didn't have much money to feed his family. I remember when we lived in a little old shack. There were four houses close together. No grass around the houses, just little old shacks. And somebody in one of those houses had chickens. And the chicken yard was the yards of all these houses. They just wandered around all four houses. And I remember when I went outside one day to see if I could find an egg, a chicken might have laid in our yard to get something to eat. So understand what it means to be hungry. We lived in a little old shack that was
was unpainted. You've been through the country and you've seen some of those old shacks that people used to live in 100 years ago. That's like one we lived in, unpainted, an old shack. No running water inside. The bathroom was about 40 feet from the house, you understand. There's no water inside, no shower, no bathtub. We had to take a bath in a number three wash tub. Are some of you old enough to remember the number three wash tub? <laughs> and we'd have to haul water in from outside for that bathtub, <laughs> that tub. And after one or two of us boys took a bath in that number three wash tub, the water looked like topsoil. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, eventually I improvised a shower. We had a little tree just outside the house near the faucet and I took a water hose up there and put it between two limbs like that to point downward then turn the water on and had a shower. Now it wasn't too comfortable in the winter time because there was no hot water coming out of it. So I understand something about poverty. Four of us boys, the oldest boys, had to sleep on one bed. We slept sideways on the bed so you'd have more room for all of them. So I understand something about being poor. I tell people that when we were young, we had to eat dried apples for breakfast, drink hot water for lunch, and then swell up for supper. <laughs> now they may be stretching it a little bit, but I understand something about being hungry as well. Uh, one person said, there were 13 kids in my family and we had to eat our cereal with a fork so we can save the milk for the next kid to have some milk to eat his cereal. That might have been stretching a little bit too, but people have been poor. I understand that. And I've worked from the sixth grade right on up through college, paying my own way. My parents didn't contribute one dime to my education. I went to the Christian Home and Bible School beginning in the sixth grade. Now, someone asked me last Sunday, if I was in the home there. I was not in the home officially, but I remember my parents talking with an uncle and aunt about what to do about us. They talked about putting us into the home at Mount Dora, the orphan home. I spent a lot of time with those kids on the campus. I spent one summer working on the campus with them to make money to pay my way to camp. And so I understand what it is to be poor. And some who may be listening may say, you don't know anything about being poor. But you know, being poor today was not like being poor when I was a boy. When I was a boy, there was no Medicaid, no welfare programs, no SSI, no food stamps. If you were poor, you were just in bad shape. Now, people who live on welfare live better than the people in Russia or Ukraine normally. I've been there. I know how poor those people are. I remember we rode all night on a train in Ukraine, stopped in Kiev, capital. They don't serve you any food on those trains. You have to take your own food if you have it. When we got off that train, there was a McDonald's there in front of the train station. Sight to behold. We went in to McDonald's and got a little to eat. Came outside, rushing to get to a bus stop to catch a bus going somewhere. And I saw an elderly lady, poor looking, old, scratching around in the garbage can. And I saw her pick up part of a hamburger that somebody had not finished. Stood there and ate it. She picked up a cup. Must have had a little bit of a liquid in it. it might have been the melted ice. And dr she drank it using the same straw somebody had used. That's poverty. We've seen a lot of that. I was working in Neprozorzinsk in Ukraine, and the brethren here had bought a little apartment for the church to meet in for worship, and that's where I stayed when I was working with them. I slept on the couch there in that little apartment, and one day I looked out the back window and you could see the trash bins out there where all the people in the apartments threw the trash away and the garbage. And I saw a man pick up an ear of corn somebody had not finished, and he stood there and ate it, picked it up out of the garbage, and stood there and ate it. That's poverty. 
people can suffer in poverty. Many have suffered in our own country, and they've suffered in other countries as well. And you wonder why. Why do people suffer in poverty in a country like ours? We're some of the richest people on earth. Sometimes people suffer because of sin. Sometimes fathers don't provide for their families. Paul said, if a man doesn't do that, he's worse than an infidel. Sometimes people suffer because their mothers engaged in sin and brought children into the world they can't feed. When I was preaching in Atlanta, in uh, Montgomery at least, at Dalreda, we had a food program. We had a lot of food there. People would stop by the building and ask for food, and we had a deacon who would fill up sacks with food and give to them. And a young girl stopped there one day, and she wanted to see the pastor. Of course, I'm not the pastor. In the Bible, the word pastor referred to the elders. The people in denominationalism don't know that, and they call the preacher the pastor. And so when she came in, spoke to the secretary, and said she wanted to talk to the pastor, the secretary knew she wanted to talk to me, and so brought her brought her in and talked to me, and I found that she had three kids, she's 17 years old, started having kids when she was 14, has three kids, not married, and each child was by a different man, and her children were hungry. There are people who are hungry because of sin, that's a result of it. She couldn't feed those children, but just kept having children like that, you know, in immorality. So people sometimes suffer because of sin. Sometimes they suffer because of circumstances beyond their control. And when we have an opportunity, we ought to help people like that. You remember that Paul teaches that some people may not work. And the Bible teaches, neither let him work. Don't give him food to eat if he doesn't work. Second Thessalonians 3 and 10, I believe. That's not it. Read the whole book. It'll do you good. <laughs> and so people sometimes don't work. You go into a restaurant today, and I'll guarantee you, on the front door you'll see a sign that says, Now Hiring. And that's true with many other stores as well. But there are people who are supposed to be poor and hungry. And they're not working. We saw something new this past week. Uh, Mackie and I had to go for a doctor's appointment over in Montgomery. We got off on Taylor Road, went down just a little bit to the entrance to uh, the shopping center there. And you know, when you get off the expressway, there are people up there with signs begging for money. And there was a young couple out there begging for money. They were well-dressed, clean, not dirty, filthy, well-dressed, with a little sign he had improvised, begging for money from a motel and gas and food, but it was different. He was walking back and forth so the cars could see that sign, but there was a young lady walking with him. I presume it was his wife or maybe his girlfriend, but she was walking along with him with an umbrella over their head, you know, keep the sun from yeah. burning. <laughs> you saw them too? Oh, yeah. yeah. Several places. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'd never seen that before. They were in comfort anyway. The sun wasn't hurting them too bad, but they were clean cut. You'd think you ought to be out finding them a job and working somewhere. But some people don't work. And we don't have an obligation to use the Lord's money to give to people that won't work. Sometimes people are poor in circumstances beyond their control. We have an obligation to help people like that. When Jesus gave a picture of the judgment day in Matthew 25, beginning with verse 31, he taught that the judgment was going to be partially, at least, on this basis. Do we help other people in need? Do we serve people? When the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory, and say to those on His right hand, Come, ye blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And they will say, Lord, when we do this? And He said, Inasmuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it unto me. And to those on His left, He will say, Depart from me, you curse it to everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And they'll say, Lord, when do we not do this? 
He said, inasmuch as you did it not unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it not unto me. And so we're going to be judged in the judgment day in part of whether we are concerned about other people and we help those who were in need. I know we have trouble sometimes in determining whether we ought to help somebody or not. That's a difficult thing. When I told about that lady eating that hamburger in front of McDonald's, I'm ashamed to say it, and, I, and I, my conscience still bothers me because I didn't think to take her inside McDonald's and buy her a good meal. We were in a hurry, rushing to get to a bus stop, and it didn't cross my mind. But since then, it has crossed my mind. I'm embarrassed to say it, that we didn't take her inside and buy her a good meal. It's sometimes difficult for us to determine who we ought to help and who we ought not to help. But there are people who are suffering because of circumstances beyond their control. Now, the Bible gives some hope and promises to those who are Christians. Christians are better off than those who are not Christians. I'm not saying we're better than other people, but we're better off than other people. If we're Christians, we have the promise that God's going to take care of us. Matthew 6, after talking about food, clothing, and shelter, the necessities, he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. We have the promise that the Lord's going to take care of us if we serve him. In Philippians 4, 19, Paul said, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory, by Christ Jesus. And so the best thing we can do for people is to teach them, lead them to become Christians, and then the Lord take care of them. They're going to have opportunities. I believe God's providence works for those who are children of God. We're better off than those who are not serving God. We have the promise that the Lord takes care of us. And then we need to learn the lesson of contentment. Uh, we may be discontented because we don't have as much as a, a rich person next door. But we're not promised that we're going to be as rich as that person next door. We are promised that the Lord will supply our needs. And so Paul said in Philippians 4.11, I've learned in what sort of state I am therewith to be content. We need to learn that lesson of contentment. In 1 Timothy 6 and verse 8, Paul said, and having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. And so we need to pray to God and ask Him for what we need, but we need to be content with what He supplies for us. Suppose a, a man has $12 million, and another man has 12 children. Which one would be the most contented? The world would say, man with $12 million, he'd be content. Well, that's not right. When people are rich, they're not content. They want more and more. You read recently about Elon Musk making an offer to buy Twitter for $45 billion, and then it apparently has fallen through. But why do you think he bought that thing, or tried to? Because he saw it would make him some more money. He only has $245 billion, richest person in the world, but he wasn't content. And so this person with $12 million won't be content, but the man with 12 kids is. He doesn't want any more. <laughs> so that's the one who will be content. We need to develop that attitude of contentment and be content with what God has given to us. Now, the Bible teaches also that poverty and wealth have their dangers. We sometimes say, if we're poor, Man, I wish I could be rich, but you know they're dangerous in being rich. In uh, the book of Proverbs, chapter 30, verses 7 through 9, Solomon said, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Now pay careful attention to this. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and take the name of my God in vain. There's a danger in being rich. If we are rich, we may forget about the Lord. We'll ask, Who is the Lord? Don't even know Him. If we're rich, 
we have a tendency to depend upon ourselves. We don't need God, we think. And so there's a danger in being rich. There are dangers in being poor. Because if I'm poor, I might be tempted to steal, to get something to eat. That'd be wrong. Or I might uh, use the name of God in vain. I might rail against God because of my condition, because I'm poor. So there are dangers in both directions. And our purpose here on earth is to glorify God, believe in God, serve God. And then he gives us a promise that we will have what we need. And it's only for this life that we have these material things. These material blessings are for this life, not the life to come. I believe I've mentioned that when I was preaching for the Dalrada Church in Montgomery, I conducted approximately 100 funerals for one congregation. And so many times I've ridden in that car right behind the hearse going out to the silent city of the dead to lay someone to rest. But all of these years, I have never seen a U-Haul trailer hitched to the back of that hearse. <laughs> never have. They can't take it with them. When we die, we leave all those material things here on earth. I read a story a couple of times recently. That's really not a scriptural illustration, but it does teach one good point, I think. It says a man knew he was going to die pretty soon, and he gathered all of his gold up and put it in a suitcase to take with him. He's going to take his gold with him. And the story says he died and went to heaven. And Peter met him at the gate. And Peter saw that he had a suitcase and asked him, what did you bring in a suitcase? And the man opened it, and Peter saw that he had a lot of gold in that suitcase. And Peter had a puzzled look on his face and said, why did you bring pavement? Now think about that. You remember that John describes heaven as having a street of gold? which was transparent as glass, where that shows it's just figurative language. It's not going to be a literal street of gold. But God uses the most precious words in our vocabulary to describe heaven, to make us want to go there. What's a precious metal to you? Gold. And so he just used that for pavement in heaven. <laughs> you won't need these material blessings in heaven. And so the Bible teaches us that it's for this life now, we can lay up treasures in heaven, but I don't believe it's going to be gold and diamonds when we get there. But we'll, we'll lay up treasures in heaven by giving to God properly here upon earth. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, you remember that Jesus tells us to lay up treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. And so we need to think about heaven Think about laying up treasures there and realize what we need here is just the necessities of life. Jesus teaches that we don't need to worry about what we will eat or drink or wear in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, 25 through 33. And in Psalm 37, verse 25, David said, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. Well, I believe that God's providence would take care of those who are His. Now, He doesn't promise us that it will be T-bone steaks from Longhorn Steakhouse. It might be beans and rice from Walmart. We need to learn the lesson of contentment. We'll have what we need, but we don't have to be discontent because we don't have what Elon Musk had. There's another thing I want to emphasize about this business of being poor and thinking about the blessings we have, we really need to realize how blessed we are. If I should ask all of those in this audience or online, how many of you are rich? I doubt that anybody would say I am. But let me ask you something. Have you ever thought of yourself in comparison with the rich young ruler? Think about the rich young ruler. Do you remember that story, Matthew 19, verse 16, beginning? The Bible says he was a rich young ruler. Now, there's no one passage that calls him the rich young ruler. But if you put all the accounts together, we learn that he was a rich young ruler. 
Now, let me tell you some things about the rich young ruler and then tell me how you compare with him. No matter how rich he was, he could not ride in a car. He could not have had surgery if he had appendicitis or cancer. He could not come into his house and hit a switch and turn on the electric light. He couldn't buy penicillin when he had an infection of some sort. He could not watch TV every night. He could not type a letter. He could not mow a lawn with these fancy lawnmowers today. He could not wash dishes in running water or with a dishwasher. He could not fly in an airplane. He could not sleep on an inner spring mattress. He couldn't talk on a telephone. Now think about it. He's a rich young ruler. The Bible says he was rich. What does that say about us? Are we poor or rich? Well, maybe a relative term, but we're rich compared to the rich young ruler and compared to many people in the world. So we need to realize how blessed we are and thank God for what we have. It may not be the T-bone steak from Roadhouse Grill. It might be beans and rice. But you can get along pretty well on that. Look how fat I've become eating that type of thing. <laughs> well, we can suffer through being older. We can suffer through being poor. There are other ways in which we can suffer physically, accidents, and the principles that we talked about in regard to sickness would apply to that as well. When I was preaching in Atlanta, we had a fellow preacher there working at another congregation who had a son who was injured playing football in high school, and he was paralyzed. And he was paralyzed the rest of his life. He lived like that for 25 years. Think of the heartache and suffering that the mother and father went through when they had to take care of him as if he were a little newborn baby. We can suffer through accidents. But those principles that we talked about in regard to sickness would apply to that as well. And we can suffer the persecution. We talked about that. Paul teaches, Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So we can suffer in that way as well. Brother David taught a wonderful series on the book of Revelation here a few months ago. Did a great job with it. And one of the things we need to remember from the book of Revelation is that it is a picture of God's people going through persecution and the fact that they will be victorious. And so I have said, if you will write two words at the end of the book of Revelation, you will have its gist. We won. That's it. We won. God's people will be victorious. No matter what the persecutions are, God is more powerful. If God be for us, who can be against us? Romans 8, 31. doesn't matter who's on the other side if God's on our side. And so when we face these problems in life, whether it's accident, sickness, old age, or poverty, we have God on our side. and He will see us through and bless us abundantly. Well, our time is about up. I appreciate the way that you've listened today. You've been a good audience. Appreciate it. Hope you'll be with us the next time.